Reggae month is February. February is Reggae month. Come catch the rhythm virtually. We gone online totally on Reggae month TV. Mega reggae concerts, interesting reggae documentaries, informative reggae symposia, and lots and lots more. Online daily from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. on PBCJ, Jam Vision, JCDC Facebook page, and several other cable and social media platforms. Details available on the Reggae Jamaica mobile app, Reggae month TV. Tune in daily and be entertained and informed. Greetings, Reggae family, and welcome to another staging of Reggae Open University. I am sitting in as host, Colleen Douglas is my name. It is actually our very, very last week for Reggae Open University for Reggae Mon 2021, where we've taken it to you virtually. I should just share that the Jamaica Reggae Industry Association is an independent, non-government organization serving the needs and furthering the common interests of individuals, institutions, and firms directly and indirectly involved in the entertainment, music and entertainment industries. I want to take this opportunity to thank all our sponsors, especially the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment, and Sport, the Ministry of Tourism, the Chase Fund, Sajikor, Starlight Productions, JTB, TF, CPTC, Java, JCDC, Reggaeville, Rhythm Agency, Surfer Reggae, Reggae Festival Guide, M1 Production, and SR Rehearsal Studios. This evening, we're actually also on Nationwide. Thank you, Nationwide, for coming on board our Reggae Month event. We're on Nationwide, and so for our radio audience, thank you so much for joining us. For all those joining us on the Reggae Month TV, on the various platforms, whether it's with PBCJ, whether it be J JCDC, Minister Grange's Facebook page, Jaria Entertainment, or Reggaeville, we welcome you and we thank you. Um, this afternoon, we are looking at Reggae Gone Global, and I am very, very pleased to introduce our moderator, who is no stranger to the music business. She might not be in music industry, but definitely music is her business. Her name is Dr. Sonia Stanley Nile, who is a scholar, cultural activist, writer, blogger, and international speaker. She's the first PhD cultural studies graduate from the University of the West Indies, and the first to be appointed lecturer and senior lecturer in the cultural studies there. She's also the inaugural Rhodes Trust Rest Neckleford Fellow in cultural studies, and has distinguished herself as a pioneer in the terrain of Caribbean cultural studies. She's the author of the acclaimed full-length book on Jamaican dance hall, Dance Hall from Slave Ship to Ghetto, 2010, and editor of Dance Hall, a read on Jamaican music and culture, 2020, which is the first compilation of seminal and current writings on dance hall music and culture. I also notice on social media that it is at a special rate at the University Press, so you should go and get your copy now. Dr. Stanley Naya has been the director of the Institute of Caribbean Studies and the Reggae Studies Unit at the University of the West Indies since 2015 and holds international appointments as member of the International Scientific Committee of the Slave Route Project, UNESCO, senior research associate at the Rhodes University. She's a leading author, teacher and researcher on black Atlantic performance geographies, popular music culture and the sacred. She serves on various boards and editorial collectives, forgive me, Sonia, for doing this, in academic associations, institutions, and journals, and is very involved in various efforts to promote national and regional development. Um, I'm very pleased this evening to introduce our moderator for our session on Reggae Gone Global, Dr. Sonia Stanley Naya. Sonia, over to you. Thank you so much, Colleen, uh, for this introduction. It's kind of strange to hear sometimes about yourself. I almost think of it as, you know, the third person. But let me <laughs> welcome all our, our viewers, our listeners. It is my pleasure to be your moderator this evening. I come to you from the University of the West Indies, but of course, academic institutions are those with walls that need to be torn down. And those of you who know me know that I'm one for access. In fact, these reggae months Open university conversations are really about spreading knowledge far and wide, creating points of access for people all over the world. So those of you who know me know that I am an advocate 
I'm a cultural advocate, I'm a cultural activist, and I am very much interested in the business of Jamaican music. So I, I'm very pleased to have been asked to, to be your moderator this evening. And I want to first thank the Jeria team for asking me to be here with you um, all. So we have quite a stellar panel lined up for you. None other than veterans in the business, uh, none other than uh, practitioners who are steeped in reggae music, they can tell you all about what's happening far and wide all over the globe. And I'm going to now introduce to you um, Copeland Forbes, who takes the floor first. There are so many hats which have been worn by Copeland Forbes. Arguably Jamaica's most prolific tour manager, artist manager. Forbes is a reggae historian who has put Jamaica on a number of maps since the country gained independence. Um, Forbes has been a driving force behind the globalization of reggae music for the past 49 years. How many persons can say that they have been in any business for 49 years? 20 years, 30 years, but certainly not 49. He has made valuable contributions in the careers of reggae artists. In fact, reggae superstars, Bob Marley, the Mighty Diamonds, Black Uhuru, Third World, Gregory Isaacs, The Wailing Wailers, Culture, The Meditations, Jack and Emos and Plaza, and we'd be here for the rest of the evening if I was to tell you all of them. Um, there is no bigger introduction than someone who has worked in the business for 49 years, and so it is my pleasure to welcome Copeland Forbes to give us his remarks on the growth of the music internationally and through his own personal experiences. Well, that was a very good introduction. The only thing, can you all hear me, right? Only, yes, we can hear you. The only thing is that, that um, those years need to be upgraded now. If you take a 62 from, 2000, from 20 and 21, you will see how long it is. It's 58 going 59 years now. Right. So, um, so I am pleased and honored to be a part of this um, university. Anything to do with reggae and the music and Jamaican culture, you know, I'm always there. I remember seeing um, Sister uh, Stanley Naya in Rotterdam at Reggae University, you know. So any part of the world I go, I'm always running into one of my people, right? Um, the topic of reggae gone global or what's happening on the international scene. It goes without saying, you know, as you know, the pandemic has really put a real, real wrench into the, the spinning wheel of um, our music and our um, tradition of, uh, of our culture. Um, I am in touch almost with every promoter around the world, almost on a daily basis to see when and how, you know, things are gonna slacken up a little, you know, to, to, to so the artists can make their trot on because as we know, most of our artists, uh, if not all, earn their living by live performances, not by uh, record sales. So when we have a damper like this, then you know it's hurting bad. And when I can hear even promoters are saying that venues are closing, staff are being laid off because nothing is happening, then you know it, it transcends and it's like a chain reaction that goes right across the board. Um, I feel it bad for some of our younger artists who, because we have a bunch of young artists who are coming up at this stage, you know, and to be stopped in their track at this stage without any, any, any hope of movement. Because last year, I remember everybody was saying, okay, by September, October, you're gonna see everything flowing. September, October come and it's gone. And then I saw a couple months ago, itineraries with that protege and Morgan Heritage put out for 2021 April and thing, I started laughing because I said this must be a joke because I'm in touch with everybody across the world. And even Klaus at the Summer Jam said to me, listen, if by January this thing don't go up, there won't be anything for the summer. So if we are looking ahead for another quiet year of no physical activity, so to speak, more than these virtual things that is going on, which is getting oversaturated now because people are just missing the live energy, so to speak. 
and um, it's affecting you know a lot of people. I myself was affected last year because actually I'll tell you all, I had planned my book launch for October in, in, um, in, in Easter month. And because of the pandemic, slow movements moving around the world, I had a big opening planned at the Royal Albert Hall with uh, Phil the London Philharmonic Orchestra surrounded by Sly and Robbie and acts that I've worked with. And this was spearheaded by the same gentleman who did the Jamaica 50 at the London O2, Rob Hallett, who's a dear friend of mine. So we had to pull up stumps and try to shift things around and move in a different direction. Now, we have planned to do it in April, in spring, right? And as most people may know by now, that I have signed a contract with Downsound Publishing, book publishers, which is a new arm of Downsound Entertainment. And my book would be the first one that is going to be launched out on the Downsound Entertainment. So I feel honored that at least I have a Jamaican entity that is, is involved and who understands everything about what we are about in music and our culture. Um, I just hope that you know, some changes will come about um, within the next couple of months, because as you know, most of these festivals take months to plan, right? And look at Rotterdam, that goes for one whole week. Now you can't use one month or two months to plan that. And if by next month, we don't see something that gives us some light at the end of the tunnel, we know, well, what is going to happen? I, last night I was on the phone with some of my people down in South America, Rafael Costa, he does all the shows in Brazil. Brazil is on a standstill just the same way. All that was planned had to be, they had to use the word postponed, you know, cause if they say cancel, those people who buy tickets and are holding them, they would have to refund money. So this thing of cancel has been used last year. So it canceled for later in the year and then it canceled for early this year. I don't think we can hear cancellation anymore. Um, not cancellation, they postponed. Postponed, I'm sorry. They've been using postponed all along. But I think we're going to start your cancellation now because you can't postpone four or five times. You know, you must have something in, in, in line up. So I'm just hoping and keeping my fingers crossed that we will have some kind of light at the tunnel because I can tell you, I'm feeling it for some of these young artists, especially those who weren't really getting a lot of jobs out there. Right, and a whole year went by without anything. Sometimes I wonder how they managed to even survive. But with the help of God, I know we will pull through because um, we, are a, we, are, we are a country with courage, you know, and a, a lot of resilience, you know. So um, I'm hoping that um, things will get better. I spoke to my friends in Thailand last night just to see what the, the vibe down there is like. And everybody the same thing in Nigeria, in Ghana, just to get a taste of the world. And then my friend, Peter Noble in Australia, that does the Blues Festival, I'm in touch with him on a daily basis. And he's feeling the same thing too, because all the festivals down there are just on a park. So I'm just hoping that um, we will get some light at the tunnel soon. And you know, we just have to be strong and we have to be together in love and unity. Now is the time that we should look out for our brothers and sisters, you know, because not everybody is fortunate, like the next one, you know, who, who may have something in the can that you can hold on to, some has nothing to hold on to. So I'm um, just honored that I get this opportunity to kind of speak a little about what's happening on the international scene and reggae music will always be there, I can tell you that. You know, we have more people jumping in, jumping in, jumping in from all parts of the world. We just had a big band in China that joined the ranks of being a reggae band in China. So we just have to keep our fingers crossed and pray and hope for the best. And with the love and unity of all of us, we will push on and we'll break this chain that is in front of us. If you're just joining, if you're just joining us, we are at Reggae Open University, right here at Reggae Month 2020, Catching the Rhythm virtually. You just heard Mr. Copeland Forbes, who had a reflection somewhat on, on the music industry. Our moderator is Dr. Stanley Nair. Just want to say hello to our radio audience at Nationwide FM. It is now um, based on my time, 6.23. And so, Sonia, I am throwing back at you so that you can continue this program. Thank you so much, Colleen. 
Uh, you know, Copeland, there are many persons listening who would be quite aware of the effects of COVID-19, but certainly not aware of just how much it has affected so many of our creatives, so many of our um, creative practitioners in the music business. And I know that many of us would have memories of, you know, the days when we were out, out, out in the streets, out on, on flights, out on tour. And I think some people would want to hear um, the ways in which you and, and, and your team would have traversed the globe. And I particularly want to ask you, for example, about you know, some of the ways our practitioners today can strengthen their own craft, strengthen their own um, you know, operations so that when the time comes for them to go out again, they have some of the skills, they have improved their, their, their own operations to be able to, to, to move across the globe freely. I certainly hope that many persons are not sitting idly by um, waiting for reopening and then um, still with nothing major to be able to carry on the scene. But certainly I want to hear more from you in relation to some of the recommendations you would have for practitioners. Maybe so now know. let me ask. Okay, go ahead. Well, let me ask Lily Claire to give her own comments and I will introduce Lily Claire Bellamy who holds a BA LLB and MA degrees um, and is a Commonwealth Fellow as well as currently serving as the Executive Director of the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office. Ms. Bellamy has extensive experience in intellectual property law, health administration and law, environmental, gender and child development issues. In her role as Executive Director at um, JIPO, she directs the administration, legal and policy aspects, provides legal advice and guidance relating to intellectual property laws, international relations, and other issues. She has represented Jamaica numerously um, in relation to international intellectual property programs. She currently serves on numerous boards, including within collective management organizations. Lily Claire, can we hear from you on ways in which the system of protection and exploitation through um, intellectual property and other um, instruments protecting cultural heritage would manifest. Thanks so much, Sonia. Good evening. It's my pleasure to join the Reggae University. I was here for the first one and I'm here for the last one. So it's really good. Um, it just shows the importance and relevance of intellectual property to this area of music, which is something that we own, which is his which belongs to Jamaica, though others have tried to claim it as their own. Um, but I just wanted to take the opportunity to point out the relevance of an intellectual property office for the reggae, for reggae music, reggae industry, and for everyone who is connected in any way with the industry. As was mentioned by our first speaker, um, we are global. We touch, I think, I don't think there's one country in the world, and I don't think there's a Jamaican who has traveled who someone hasn't asked them about a specific reggae artist. When you hear Jamaica, you think of a reggae artist. There's that connection. So the government of Jamaica, in recognition of the importance of reggae music and of all our creatives, has always had intellectual property laws in place. For those of us who are um, students of history or who are old enough, you would know that we used to have a copyright unit. I'm dealing specifically with copyright since we're dealing with music, even though other areas of intellectual property are also relevant. But there was a copyright unit and the significance of that copyright unit was in the late 1990s, there was a recognition that yes, there were collecting societies throughout the world and Jamaican artists were members of different collecting societies, but we didn't have our own indigenous collecting society. And I think in this time of the pandemic, the relevance and importance of a collecting society is even more important because the fact as 
Mr. Forbes mentioned, if you're not able to perform, you still want to be able to earn. And if your music is being played, then there's hope, then there's hope for someone to hear your work because it's being broadcast and you still have an opportunity to earn. So in the late 1980s, um, the copyright unit was, um, which was then um, seated in the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce, was instrumental in the formation of two of our foundation collecting societies in Jamaica, JCAP and Jam Copy. Um, JCAP and Jam Copy both celebrated their 21st anniversaries recently. And for those of you who don't know, JCAP is the Jamaica Association of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. And Jam Copy is the Jamaica Copyright Licensing Agency. Um, JCAP has a number of well-known Jamaican artists who are, who are members and who have earned royalties from being members of those associations. And I want to stress the importance of persons joining and becoming members of these collective management organizations. Because if you're not a member of a collective management organization, and you're not a member of any of the existing music societies out there, when you fall on hard times, you're on your own. And it's important for you to understand how a collective management organization can help you. I know for a fact that during the pandemic, um, the collective management organizations, JCAP for example, provided support to its membership and that support is continuing. So um, we have also at the level of the intellectual property office because the copyright the copyright unit merged into the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office. So in the year 2001, the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office started to operate as a whole. And in the year February 2002 was the passage of the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office Act. So we share the same month as Reggae Month. Um, with the passage of the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office Act, that office has responsibility for all intellectual property laws. Historically, there was always when persons called because under the terms of the Berne Convention of which Jamaica is a party, copyright is automatic. In the absence of you doing anything, but you've created your work and you've put it in a tangible format. So you've written it down on a piece of paper or a napkin in a restaurant or anything, you've written it on something, because as the inspiration comes to you, you write it on whatever you can find to write it on. That act of writing it down or recording it means that you now have it in a tangible format and your copyright automatically comes into place without you doing anything else. When persons call our office and we say to them, your copyright is automatic once it's in a tangible format, and they're like, you mean there's nothing else that I need to do? So in response to the request from members of the public, we amended the Copyright Act in Jamaica to allow persons to have a voluntary registration system. So this is a system where if you have created a work, you can bring it to our office not the tangible copy, but the soft copy. We'll store it for you and we'll give you a certificate. Um, that certificate you sign in the presence of a justice of the peace to say that you are the owner or the author of the work. And what that does for you is it gives you something that you can use as evidence to prove that you really produce that work. And our theme today is Reggae Gone Global, and it's significant and important because sometimes persons will say that they are not aware that the work had an owner, or they will say, oh, the work is an orphan work, therefore they're free to use it because it doesn't belong to anybody. And there's one Jamaican who, he was quite a prolific producer and had quite a number of work. And an entity in the UK did an advertisement using his work on the pretense that it was an orphan work. 
Well, he made a visit to the intellectual property office and was able to deposit his works with us. And he was able to say to them, you know, see, here I have a certificate to prove that I am the author of these works. The other thing I'd like to share in terms of, and this is not the remit of the intellectual property office, but actually the remit of the national library. Each time someone creates a work in Jamaica, I'm going to encourage you to pay a visit to the National Library because under the Legal Deposit Act, you should deposit your works with the National Library because we need to have a record of what we have produced and what we have created. So after we're gone and generations after us, we'll be able to go to the library and to see the work, to be able to write about the work and to tell the story of reggae music. And I know we have an oral tradition. So sometimes we don't like to write. We're in the presence of an author, Dr. Nile, but some of us don't like to write. So if you even don't want to write, what you could do is take your works to the National Library, deposit them under the Legal Deposit Act. You actually have a mandatory requirement to do that. So I'd encourage persons, and it's worth your while to deposit your work under the Legal Deposit Act, because if you do it in a timely manner, you get money in return for the deposit. So I'd encourage persons to use the Legal Deposit Act and to also come to the Intellectual Property Office um, where we can give you a certificate to show that you have created your work. But I think it's very important for persons also, if you're not aware, to take the time to learn what your rights are under the Copyright Act. And the other thing I'd encourage persons to do is before you sign any contract or get involved in any agreement with anybody, you need to get the services of an attorney at law. And there are intellectual property attorneys in Jamaica who have indicated to our office that they will be willing to assist. So if you get in touch with us at JIPO, we can give you the name of those attorneys because persons always say, oh, they can't afford an attorney. But sometimes it's better to go to an attorney even they have to borrow money to go to the attorney because your ignorance may result in you signing away 100% of what you have versus paying an attorney 10% or whatever the going rate is. So I'd encourage every single artist, because if you, if you go back in history and we read the story, you'll hear quite a number of our artists bemoaning the fact that they signed away their rights and they weren't, they didn't know what they were doing. Somebody told them, okay, here is 10 pounds and just sign here and they signed. And then their music became popular and they only earned that 10 pounds. So it's important to seek guidance before you sign and accept any form of remuneration. Well thank, said. Thank you. Thank you, Lily Clare. Um, thank you very much, Lily Clare, for, for sharing with us. Thank you, Copeland, for jumping in. Um, again, I'm just reminding you that you are at Reggae Open University. We are streaming live on Nationwide Radio, Reggae Mon TV on various channels, PBCJ, JCDC, Minister Granger's Facebook page, of course, Jaria Entertainment and Reggaeville Facebook page, as well as the YouTube channels. I just want to use the opportunity again to say thank you to our sponsors for Reggae Month, the main sponsor, the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment of Sport, and Sport rather, the Ministry of Tourism, TEF, Chase Fund, Sajikor, Starlight Productions, um, CPTC, Java, Reggaeville, Rhythm Agency, Surfer Reggae, Reggae Festival, Guide, M1 Production, SR Rehearsal Studios. I'm Colleen. I'm anchoring this evening. And in Zoom land, we have our very, very able moderator, Dr. Sonia Stanley Nair, Director of the Institute of Caribbean Studies and Reggae Studies Unit at the University of the West Indies. Sonia, over to you. Thank you so much, Colleen. And thank you very much, um, Lily Clare, 
produce, 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 but protect, protect, protect is the takeaway from your presentation. And indeed, never let it be said that the structures are not in place in Jamaica to do the kind of protection that's needed in, in terms of global best practices. But are we, in fact, using those systems appropriately? And so I, I will come back to you, in a sense, to comment on the ways in which perhaps even an education program might be necessary at this stage in our own um, sphere here in Jamaica. So let me introduce our, our, our third panelist, uh, Mr. Ibo Cooper. Ibo, of course, needs no introduction, but as a veteran of the influential reggae band Inner Circle, co-founder of Third World, who was its keyboardist and a songwriter and vocalist until he left that band in 1997, Ibo Cooper has served in so many capacities um, then and since. After 25 years on the road, Cooper embarked on a new life as a teacher at the Edna Malley College of the Visual and Performing Arts, where he is still active. He's also an advocate for reggae and popular music in Jamaica. He's also a former chair of Jaria and currently sits on the board as chair of the Education Committee. Ibo, I would love for you to share with us from your own personal experience, um, the growth of the music internationally and ways in which you would want to recommend, even as we consider COVID-19 times, how it is that the industry can in fact grow. Thank you very much, Sonia. Um, greetings and welcome to all the viewers and listeners. Am I being heard clearly? We are hearing you. Good. Um, the topic, Reggae Gone Global, needs a historic perspective. And how did reggae go global? So I'm going to rewind to a time when a tour for a reggae artist was from Kingston to Ocho Rios, and Round the Island shows were popular. At that time, if you got a hit in the British charts, that was big. So many of our early pioneers went over to England, Jimmy Cliff, um, the Vagabonds, Owen Gray, and all of these people went up into England. And in England, there was an active movement of sound systems. That in those days, there was no playing on the radio in England in terms of BBC and all of that for most of the music. So sound systems were rolling all around England and UK and Europe and actually must take the credit for making the music popular in those days. Gone global in the larger sense though, the, 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 the nadir moment would be when, as them say in our parlance, Bob Marley bus. And when Bob emerged um, and started to tour as a headline act in the early to mid 70s, I'm going to use Bonnie Rose's phrase from Reggae Ambassador. The little music came from the, the big music came from the little island to the world. And in a personal conversation with me and Bob, because all of us young, you know, want to make it, you know. And so Bob out there, you know, so I said, so Bob, how is, how is it out there on the road? He said, boy, I want to tell you, you know, when I'm waiting backstage to go on, you have some boy up playing you know, on them finger fast. And I'm wondering how I can go on after them. But then when we go out there, that rhythm. And so even Bob himself was surprised at the captivating rhythm and how it affected the people around the world in his early tours. Now, there had been influences before that because you had, I can see clearly now, Johnny Nash. You had Bob writing Guava Jelly for the same work, Johnny Nash. So it was creeping out there, but it was now going to be recognized in the eyes of the world as the music of resistance, the poor people music, the music of struggle. And it transcended the language barrier and also now made us the rest of the musicians and, and, and bands who was uh, our scope was Kingston to Ochi. We now started to move overseas, not just to the Jamaican communities, but to other communities in colleges in the UK and so on. So that is really how the thing was global. And having gone global, it changed the actual definition of reggae because 
We had Skia, then we had Rocksteady, and Reggae was the next genre. But right around that period, with Bob's explosion to the world, the world then started to see Reggae as everyone who came out of Jamaica. And so eventually, the child became the parent, so to speak. And Reggae became the definition of everything from Jamaica. So on the Reggae shelf, you would see Skia, Mento, and things that came before it. When we went out there, you know, in that, in that period, that early period, Tower Records and these companies were the big companies. There was no such thing as a reggae shelf yet. You see what I'm saying? You couldn't go to the shelf and buy a shelf dedicated to reggae music. So it started to grow with Bob and Peter and Bunny as the Wailers, making that first significant album that was considered the first concept album, and that was Catch a Fire. Um, again, I said before that, you had Millie Small, big hit across the world, but this was significant. This took it to every corner and crevice. And I want to pick up on something that Copeland said, because after that, we used to assume that everybody across the world knows reggae, because you know it started to spread, Babylon by bus, and everybody touring all over the place. But when Jaria sent a group to Shanghai, in the beginning of the Jaria days, they were surprised. Because in China, Bob was not that well known. So what Copeland said a while ago is significant. Because for us to know our Chinese reggae band is also significant. And people keep mixing up Japan and China. Japan had embraced the music earlier. Now, touching on what Lily Clear, to bring Lily Clear um, um, testimony into the mix, you have to also look at in the early days, if we're honest, we did not have the collection societies yet. It was PRS from England. And if we're honest, we, most of us, did not understand intellectual property properly. And so many people suffered, and many artists made their music and did not know what was to be collected and how the ownership rights were to be distributed. We suffered from that for a long time until certain amendments were made to the copyright law and institutions like Jaipa were set up and JCAP and JAMS. And I will tell you of a story, for example. Rivers of Babylon, Brent Dow, sold three million copies in Germany, done by Boney M. And if I was to start to tell you the confusion that it caused about who owned the rights, okay? And similarly, when John Holtz, Tide is High, was done by Blondie, right? The original recording says Paragons after it became popular. <clears throat> I don't want to speak evil of the dead, but the reality is that the lead singer said, no, it's my tune. So we had a lot of mix up when it came to intellectual property. So everything you're already seeing is relevant in the reggae gone global. But I wanted to give you the perspective of the early days, how reggae, reggae went global. Uh, unfortunately, one of our panelists could not come this evening because he was supposed to tell us about reggae gone global now to influence the dance world, in the, in the, especially in the dance hall era. And now reggae dance and dance hall is not only taught all over the world, but we now have festivals and contests that are patterned from what we did here in Jamaica. Let us face it, Rotterdam never even take out the Sunsplash over the main. It is called the Rotterdam Sunsplash, and it's a straight pattern of our Sunsplash. Because I've heard people who go away and did not know about Sunsplash, and say, boy, look how the foreign of them know our thing. No, they copied our thing. I want to make that statement. So when we talk about reggae gone global, that is what I want to say about it. And finally, I want to say that on the very first tour that Bob Marley made, as an opening act now, Bob and the Whalers, as an I'm sorry, as a headline act on the England leg, that was the real breaking point for Third World because we just signed with Island Records and Island Records put us on as the opening act for the whole of the UK leg of that tour. We played the Lyceum in London, the Hard Rock in Manchester, and the Art Academy in Brixton. Four gigs opening for Bob and earned us the cover story in what was the biggest tabloid in Britain at the time. Melody Maker, Copeland knows Melody Maker quite well. <coughs> when you make Melody Maker, cover in England, it's like you make a Rolling Stones cover. So that was good for a band that just come out of Jamaica, don't reach the way yet, you see? So that is how reggae got global. I will leave it at that, and we can take it up from you. Give thanks, Ibo. Thanks very much. That was Michael Ibo Cooper.
um, Kingsley, Ibu Cooper, sharing with us about Reggae Gone Global. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Reggae Open University right here on Nationwide Radio, as well as Jaria Reggae Month TV, rather, on various platforms, PBCJ, JCDC, Minister Grange's Facebook page, Jaria Entertainment on Facebook, as well as Jaria Entertainment on YouTube, Reggaeville on Facebook, as well as Reggaeville on YouTube. My very, very, or very, very able uh, moderator, Dr. Sonia Standinaya, is in Zoom, and we go back to her. Thank you so much, Colleen. You know, I wanted to... First of all, thank Ibo for taking us back into, into that perspective, a bit of a history, throwing it back. Um, and I, I really want to remind us that there are ways in which we can quantify the, the, this, this global reggae industry. The Tom Fleming business plan approximated that 6,000 to 12,000 persons were employed in the music industry of Jamaica with some 2,500 being musicians and 1,700 employed by sound systems. An additional 600 were studio performers estimated to be professional performers, including musicians. 24% of total workers were self-employed individuals and the typical self-employed worker averaged 10.3 years of education. That same study, following from Vanus James's study in 2007, estimated that the cultural and creative industries contributed 5.2% to the gross domestic product, generating revenue of US 15 to US 20 million annually, accounting for 3% of total employment. So when we think about Reggae Gone Global, we are definitely also able to think about the kind of creative work, the value of that creative work that is very much a part of this conversation. The, the, the ways in which we can think about expanding that, that globalization of the music is, is really what I want you to focus on in your, in your finalizing comments. Um, you know, your closing comments, what, what would you say about this creative work? Where do we go? Yes, reggae is gone global. Um, we have no problems understanding that there's reggae being produced globally, reggae being consumed globally. Our artists are out there, but where do we go from here? From each of your perspectives. Well, let me jump in there. Um, it was good that Ibu actually took us back to, to I remember those early days. And um, I want to add that Back in those days, we had a lot of support from the record companies who would always give um, sub tour support so artists can go out to expose themselves. Because back in the days, in Europe especially, um, most of those festivals, you'd have to either be signed to a, a major label and have good connection to even get an opportunity to go on one of those um, concerts. You know, But now, I mean, I would say 75 to 80% of all the concerts in Europe of our reggae concerts, which is a great, great step that we have made because I never knew I would live to see reggae dominate um, a, a, a whole um, continent like what I'm seeing here. I remember going to South Africa with Jimmy in 1980. And when I look and I see 109,000 people inside that stadium in Soweto, I mean, I almost fell, fell off my, my, my feet, you know, because I said, look what one little music from a little island could do, you know, and, and pull that in. When I went to Brazil with Jimmy and we were in Salvador, and I say 65,000 people in a stadium as opposed to all 30,000 people, you know, it tells, you know, that we, we have a lot of, um, uh, uh, we have garnered a lot of attention. Now, um, the fact that we have reached that level, right? Um, and the music, when you have a music where everybody wants to sound like you, look like you, talk like you, walk like you, dress like you. I mean, red, gold, and green has gone all over the world now. And it's through the power of reggae music and Rastafari that it has really transcended to that stage. You see, Louis Vuitton have it upside it down, you know, and everybody making a big squabble about it and so on. But um, we have to more put uh, um, some more emphasis on the education right, of the business aspect of the business because most of our artists don't really understand 
um, the business aspect of the business. When, when the, the lady spoke about the, the, the copyright and all them things, them don't know anything. The other day I was watching a commercial in Florida. Oh, it's another scorcher. Is it Tenaz wrote it? One of them Tenaz the dead. It's the last one who came in the group, who wasn't even in the group when the song record. Is in benefit now because I'm trying to show people say is him is even as a member of the group, you know. So we need to educate a lot of the, the, the new ones, especially their managers, because most of the managers you know, are just there as a sidekick, so to speak. And most of them don't really move out to learn that aspect of the business. And most of them don't know that it's a business, right? It is about 70-80% business and the rest and 20% entertainment. So you need to get that out because you can't have a bunch of people going out, um, performing on stage and have no education about the music. What I hate is when I hear a foreigner can't tell us more about our music and the personnel inside of it much more, much more than, than people who in Jamaica. So let's put a little accent on the educating our, our, our players in the industry so even though we can go to do live stage performance, there can be an ongoing educational um, system going on to wider that when we get back on the road, we know how to do everything. Every time you see them give them a paper when they do a in Europe and they say, fill out the form, a man asks me, what do you mean by arranger? What do you mean by, um, you know, the writer? How will I do let me sing it? You know, I've seen that happen a lot of times. So let's put some emphasis on education so we are ready when the thing comes back uh, uh, in a live form. And we can just keep moving forward, forward, forward. And this, we just conquer the world because, you know, as Bob said, this music will keep going on and on until it finds its rightful place. You know, and its rightful place is still far away to get. So we have a lot of grounds to cover. Thank you, Copeland. This is, this is so in, important for us to kind of engage, you know? Any, any comments? Um, on what has been said, Lily Claire. Yes, thank you, Sonia. There's so much that I want to say. Um, I think it is important for us to recognize, and I thank Mr. Forrest for the point he just made, and also Eva for all of what he said earlier, because I think we're not aware of the wealth of resources that we have as a people. And UNESCO recognized reggae as part of the intangible cultural heritage of Jamaica. The importance about that is that gives us an opportunity, not only in Jamaica, but globally for us to respect something that is intrinsically ours. It also is an opportunity for us to utilize this to make future generations know about it. And the only way that future generations can know about it is if it becomes a part of our curriculum in terms of the history of reggae music should be something that is known by every single one of us in this country. Um, I'll share something recently. I was talking to some persons and I said, I mentioned Ibo's name. I said, you know, Ibo Cooper? And the person looked at me and I thought, everybody must know Ibo Cooper because he was a member of Third World and Inner Circle. But that is history. For people who are below 30, that is history. They have not a clue. So I thought, this is serious. And I mean, we have a living legend among us and people don't even recognize which says something about us, because if we don't know what our history is and we don't know what we have to be proud of and to be grateful for and to celebrate what distinguishes us, a small country in the Caribbean Sea, a small island that has touched the globe with a music that, whether you like it or not, is irrelevant. The point is it, is, it is a major force. And I think for me, the important thing is for persons to understand that this is something that you can pass on to future generations, okay? So you've written a song in the year 2021. Under the Copyright Act, you, you have rights in that for your entire life. 
And after you have died, you still have rights in it. So you can pass it on to your child, your children or your grandchildren, because it has a long life after you have died, 95 years. You may not live to 95, but your music after you have died will still live on. So the important thing for persons, what, what I want people to understand is that this is wealth, irrespective and wealth does not necessarily mean monetary wealth, okay? It is wealth at several levels, but it is also something that you can pass on to future generations. And I know we don't like to talk about wills in Jamaica. It's part of our culture that you think if you do a will, it means you're going to die. But no, what it does is it's you speaking from the grave about what you want to be done with what you earned while you were alive. So it's important for you to have that will because if you don't have the will, somebody else is going to decide who <laughs> should benefit from your work. So it's important for you to document who you want to benefit from your work. The other thing I would say to persons is if you're in the industry and you want to have a, 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 a conversation about how the Copyright Act can help you, you can come to the Intellectual Property Office. We can give you the information. We have a number of webinars that we conduct so that people become aware of what their rights are. Because it's also important for people who use the work to understand that they also have an obligation. Our music couldn't have gone global if people didn't take an interest in it. Sometimes the interest was Okay, sometimes the interest wasn't um, to the benefit of the creator, but there was still an interest and that helped, to, that helped to disseminate the message of our reggae music. Now we have an opportunity to become more informed. There are collecting societies in Jamaica that can assist you, which I would encourage every single person who is in, in the industry to become a member of. Um, they all have websites. There's JCAP, there's Jams, there's Jam Coffee. You can go online. If you call the Intellectual Property Office, we can give you information about where to find them. But, but you need to treat the reggae music as an industry because that's what it is. And one other point I want to make, Reggae Month falls under the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sports because it is a part of our culture. But internationally, intellectual property falls where? The World Trade Organization has an international agreement dealing with intellectual property. Why? Because there is a recognition that culture and creativity is a part, an integral part of trade. Trade is, I mean, trade is what people go to, people fight about. So it's something that is important and I would encourage persons to not take it lightly. This is something, this is something that you have invested your time in and your money and it is something that you should treasure. You know, Lily Claire, as you were talking, it made me reflect on some of the research that I've done on, on just being able to situate how far we're coming from and, and to throw back in the way that, you know, um, Ibo allowed us to, to do earlier. I, I, want to, I want to, you know, entreat our, our, our listeners and our viewers to some of the data. When you think about reggae as revolutionary music, reggae's pilgrims or musicians going across the globe you know, use, if we could even use Babylon by bus as, as one of the, the, the metaphorical representations of how it is our, our stars, our superstars have traveled. It's really about a revolutionary pilgrimage. And there is a way in which we have to situate that looking at where we are coming from. How many of us know that there was a prohibition on drums and horns in Jamaica from as early as 1688, which was amended in 1717. There are similar 
um, legislative instruments, acts passed in the island of Barbados, law against drums and horns, 1699. Law banning communication by horns and drums in St. Kitts, 1711. And you, you're coming along all this time and you're, you're, you're looking at the ways in which so many things were put in our way to be able to reach where it is we have reached now to have a globally recognized music. Let's not be, let's not be fooled here. And I know that those of you who are our panelists, you know, but our audience members sometimes don't know the kinds of struggles that we have had in terms of reggae reaching this global platform. So we don't need to be playing around with it. We need to be very clear about what are the systems, what are the systems to protect, ways in which you must produce, register what it is that's being produced, and also look to, to hone our craft in a business-like way um, with the standards and the global best practices clearly in mind that we're going to be able to move through our, 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 our industry and to build that industry. So any comments, um, Ibo? Before, before we go to comments, um, Dr. Naya, I just wanted to, to remind our listeners in radio, and yes, it is exactly four minutes past seven o'clock. Thank you for those tuning in on Nationwide Radio and for those tuning in through the various platforms on Regamon TV, you are listening to Reggae Open University. We are discussing Reggae Gone Global. Our panelists are Ibo Cooper, Copeland Forbes, Lily Claire Bellamy, and our moderator, Dr. Sonia Stanley Naya, who was just asking um, comments, or inviting comments rather, from our panelists on, on how Reggae is going global. Back to you, Sonia, in Zoom. Thank you so much, Colleen. Ibo, any comments there? You know, there, there's a way in which we, 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 we must situate our, our practice. And I, and I, and I think you, you, are, you are well placed to speak about, you know, just the, the kinds of, from your own personal experience, what were the struggles that you had indeed to get to this point? Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Yes, um, reggae gone global, I covered, into how it happened, what made it go global. Now, reggae going global and continuing global, I want to cover now in this context. Um, we must not assume that because it gone global and because Jamaica has been punching above its weight universally, that this is going to continue. Because even if the little fighter was wicked and punching when he was young, he does get older. So you have to either re-energize the fighter or come with some new fighters. You see, But they have to move from the platform of what went before. So going forward now in the digital age, I want to touch um, Jaipo and say to them, I know they keep using write down, write down. But the modern, the modern digital equipment, when you record on it, if it's even a cell phone, it dates you and gives you a time signature. That also is a very good way of doing copyright. Because people still looking at the poem as copyright, we must be very careful that we don't remain dated in our methodology, right? So just sing it in a cell phone and you're going to go for the time being. Now, COVID has been an, ad an, an adverse situation. But there can be opportunity in the adversity because if we utilize the digital platform and the intellect and the internet, sorry, and the intellect and the internet in ways that we are forced to know, we actually have a globally captive audience to build on. So we have to keep making content and delivering content to the World Wide Web. And that is a way of continuing earning. Because I do not want to be pessimistic, but we may not go back to what we consider normal anytime soon. So I want us to use the pattern of what happened as from genre to genre. When Skia slowed down because there was a drummer who could not keep up with the pace. Our producers did not call it a spoil. Them said the style. And guess what? It became rock steady. 
See? So, so we say, we always created something out of what could have been thrown away. So I want to say you now, going forward, this time, creativity and content is key. Okay? Trying to find ways now of using this medium. There are some parallels between the development of African-American music and the African-Jamaican music. First of all, the black history man, there are two black forms. However, because of the position of the African-American being a minority, their intellectuals took the creation of the music and art seriously and documented respectfully as it was happening. That did not happen here. And so it is time now for us, it's past the time now for us to document. Because you have a youth who can write some tune and he can sing, but that, that is what is where he stop. You get what I'm saying? There's somebody else needed now. So going global forward, so that we can have some new fighters still punching above the weight, I want us to use two templates. We have two templates Bob Marley and Usain Bolt. These are templates that we can utilize going forward. The adversities that Bob went through. There was times that he felt like giving up, but he wouldn't stop. Right? The bravery of embracing new spiritual thought when the whole nation was saying false doctrine and weathering the weather and carrying it through until the world accepted it. Serious bravery. Okay? So we have to look at how these people manage. Another pioneer that I want to quote is Chris Blackwell. Blackwell says a good idea without financing is just a good idea. This has been one of the bugbear problems of the industry. People have been scared to come on board when it comes to the art that comes from the working class. I'm sorry if people are offended, but that's so it goes. Right? Yet recently again, African Americans have been able to use their intellectual property and their catalog as collateral. I don't know if our bank's that brave. You see? So, sorry to be provoking, but we're going to gone global. How we want to keep it going global? Those are some of the things I want to show in here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ibo. You're so right. There's no guarantee that reggae will stay global. So we need to be able to put our, our business in order. I, I think there are a couple of questions. Um, let me throw to um, Colleen for any questions that may have come in. Thank you so much, Sonia. I want to actually share Reggaeville YouTube has been lighting up. They're saying, thank you for this presentation. Love reggae music out of Brazil. Someone from the Netherlands saying, greetings from the Netherlands. I appreciate this. Sonia, you said something that I didn't know about before, about the, the horns and, um, what's this? Horns and something else. I'm not seeing what they're writing because it's not in English. Horns um, and drums. Horns and drums being, being prohibited. And Colleen, if, if I may interject, right here in Jamaica, John Kuno too. They have banned John Kuno. Okay, thanks, Ibo. Um, just want to quickly, Sharon Bentley, on the Jarea's Facebook page, is speaking, picking up on something very true, 90% business and 10% music. Is there any truth to that, Dr. Sonia Naya and panelists? So I go back to you, Sonia, to see if we can address that particular um, query. Is it 90% um, business and 10% music? If I may jump in there, Copeland said it like that, but I differ a bit because I am always going to defend the ore, the raw material, the creativity, the intellectual property. That's where it comes from. So I'm saying that the little guy under the tree with him guitar, he's not worthless, or to use a Jamaican phrase, worthless. And in many families, that's who they consider him. That is the essence. That is what is going to become a WAV file. That is what is going to eventually go to iTunes. So we have to protect that person because that person has a particular inspired skill. However, where the business coming in, it's a large percentage. I don't want to actually put that percentage. Is for them to earn the value added and for them to benefit from their creativity. Of course, intellectual property protection and management and um, investment is key. Can I just add something? Please uh, jump in, Lily Claire. Okay, if I mention something in his not just now, but previously, when he spoke about the recognition of the value of the intellectual property, 
and whether a bank would accept it as collateral. So the government of Jamaica, through the Intellectual Property Office, recognized that that is an issue. Banks being willing to lend on the strength of intellectual property. So we're actually in the middle of a project with the Inter-American Development Bank and the Caribbean Development Bank to find a way, basically what we're hoping to come up with is a formula that can be utilized. So you have a repertoire of 10 works and um, this is me breaking it down very basically. I don't know if this will be the result, but you have 10 works and there would be a formula that says, okay, the value of that 10 work is $10 million. So the bank can hold those 10 works as the collateral. You know, when you go to, for example, perhaps if you're purchasing a house, then the house becomes the collateral that the bank holds while you pay off the mortgage in the same way. So you would give them your works and that is what they would hold to be able to give you the money. It's, it's a different way of seeing the world, but it is our reality. We're creative people, so we need to find a way that our financial institutions will recognize this is what we create. This is our intellectual property. How can we value it and use it so that we can put our children through schools, we can put food on the table? And the other thing I just wanted to say because yes, I always speak about writing down, but it is any tangible format. If the work yeah. is in any tangible format, the copyright comes into effect. The, the issue though is with the poor man's copyright, and that is when we're looking at it from a strict legal point of view, we need to be able to prove. And so the poor man's copyright is used as evidence, yeah. which is what we're hoping now with our voluntary registration system, which we have at the Intellectual Property Office, if you have that certificate, that can also be used as evidence. And remember, I said we actually don't take the written copy at the IP office. We take the digital format. So there is a recognition. It just has to be in a tangible format. Because if I share something with a friend, and I'm just talking to the friend and I share it. And then the friend goes and records it. It's going to be hard for me to prove that I was the one who shared it with that person. So this is why we speak about having it in a tangible format. But I think, and the point that you made earlier, Sonia, is an important point for, for us to remember, which is why I always say it is important for people to do history because if you don't know your history, you don't appreciate what you have because you think it was always there and you don't recognize the struggle. So what you take for granted, people lost their lives to achieve. So my thing is for us as a people, and this touches and concerns all aspects of our lives, we need to know our history. I mean, I always feel, and this is just me, that history should be mandatory for everybody in school, at least till they reach to grade seven, grade eight, eight grade nine. You should have history. It shouldn't be optional that you don't, because you don't know your history. You you're you're not history. going anywhere. I exactly. am I am absolutely an advocate of history, Lily Claire, and that's an entire conversation that we could have on another day. Yeah. But I have become an advocate of history and had to teach myself the history I needed to know when I was doing all of this research, even the ones that I'm sharing with you. But I want to, to point out Wait, that 90% oh no, of what you spoke, just coming to you, Ibo, 90% of what you spoke about was business. The other 10% was about the history. To throw back to Ibo's point um, or his response in relation to the comment that came from Reggaeville, um, we are really in a tight balancing act dealing with 90% business and 10%, but the 10%, the weight of that 10% really needs to be recalculated in the way that Ibo has articulated because we have to absolutely protect the talent. There are a whole lot of people out there who are producing what is not quality music. And they hear veterans in the business like Ibo talking about quality, veterans in the business like Gussie Clark talking about quality. And, and the younger producers, 
you know, musicians, they are very much into trying to get what they're calling now trap dance hall and all of these things out there. But guess what? Nothing trumps quality because it is not just a radio earplay that you're trying to get or, or, or spins in some, you know, um, satellite radio. It is also about your capacity to have generations listen to your music and going back to the royalty and the protection. How are you going to earn the residuals, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the collective rights associations and organizations that will protect you in perpetuity even after you are gone? Exactly. So let's be clear. There is that business element that needs to be considered quite carefully. In fact, let's just also place on the table that anybody who is interested in the music business ought to be interested in the business of music first. Okay. <laughs> I love that one. I love that. And can I just yes, say, sorry, Ivo, can Ivo, I just Ivo. say, okay. Well, no, I just, wanted to, say, I just wanted to say a little clear that I'm a little bit disappointed sometimes when our attrition and intellectuals start to reinvent the wheel. As far as using intellectual property as collateral is concerned, there are already templates. We can look at what is already happening, and if it don't exactly fit, we can tweak it. Sometimes we ignore these things and start to reinvent the wheel. No, no, Ibo, sorry. Happening. We're not reinventing the wheel. The templates are there, but they're not accepted by our financial institutions. So we have to, it's just like reggae music, you have to provide the institution with the talking about. And of them because in many instances that lack of acceptance is a stall it's a lack of faith oh, God. um ibo ibo has i think ibo is having a little technical difficulty technical and issue. while while we wait sonia i have another question that oh, came in God. from one second ibo we have a question that came in from or perhaps we should go back to you, Ibo, and then Sonia, if you don't mind, yes. we I'll, I'll share saying, the question. Sure, I'm saying, sure. I'm saying that the institutions, I'm not criticizing Lily Clear, I'm saying that Lily Clear, you're having the struggles, Sonia talk about the struggles in it. You're having the struggles that me and Bob and some of us and Pete and them from the early days, Copeland know from the beginning, we're having, because the institutions you're talking to, they are the ones who are not accepting and I consider it a stall because they don't want to accept what other institutions have accepted because they lose faith. They lose faith when it comes to... Uh, let me tell you what, there's a song that's called The People's Choice. It's a young man who wanted to go to dance and his mother never wanted to go to dance and it's one of my favorite lines. The grandmother said, don't go to the dance because too much weed and raster. That has been a problem with these institutions for too long. Too much weed and raster trouble them. Not weed legal, we have to bend the community. You get what I'm saying? So they went into a problem really clear. You are running into the same problem that we are used to. And so what happened, you know, that we had to seek funding from abroad or fund ourselves. And so people say, but you don't have a business, you have a hustle. Because we have had to hustle. I have been called in so many times into think tanks. So they could pick my brain on the business of venture capital. And I've given them all of the advice and the people from these various banks and so on used my thoughts, made pretty speeches, but the things never came into fruition. Reggae gone global, you know, and I can't mean anything, you know, so I'm never talking about reggae, but how the thing going on, because the struggle has them music. You know. <laughs> I, I just thank you, Ibo. Um, thanks, Sonia. I, I want to use the opportunity to also just share some of the voices from across the world as we speak about reggae going global. And one of the comments I have here as we raise the issue of reggae and ganja um, from Mexico, reggae and Rastafarian culture for me is changing every single day in my life. I'm Mexican born and raised and it's amazing how this culture influences over me to be a musician. Thanks so much, um, that is Ari Rob from Mexico. The question we got earlier on to, sh to ask is from Germany. Globally for a while, we have a huge discussion around cultural appropriation. In regards to this discussion, do you see worries about whites stealing your culture abroad? 
I'm throwing that to you, Sonia, as moderator, to, to, to take it in any direction you want to take it. You know, thanks, Colleen. I wondered when we were going to touch on um, appropriation, because, of course, the whole question of reggae going global, it comes up all the time. Is it the Jamaicans that are benefiting from this globalization of reggae? Where is this revenue going? Um, and is there um, appropriation that is happening? So let me throw that out to our panelists. I have my own opinions, obviously. All right. But let's talk about you know, appropriation. I'm going to just be shocked. Appropriation, I've spoken on this before, is going to happen. Jamaica gave a gift to the world. The United States gave jazz to the world. Jamaica gave reggae to the world. Brazil gave samba to the world. So after a while, we are going to have to realize that people will use our styles and rhythms because they are free to do so. Now, some things can be protected as intangible cultural heritage. So for example, tango from Argentina is protected. Reggae is protected now. Meaning that people will have to recognize its origins and don't act as if it, or it, it, it originated somewhere else. You get me? Jazz is recognized as an American art form, even though you have jazz musicians in China. So we're going to have to get used to it and get over it. So okay. Ibo, you brought us back to the 90% business because this business also is about the ways in which licensing protection allows for appropriation in a way that is legal there are ways in which creative works can be licensed for use and i invite our listeners and our viewers google murder she wrote there are so many i mean it's one of the most sampled of of, of rhythms that murder she wrote rhythm is very much out there being used by other creators but I am sure that the royalties are going somewhere. So let's talk about that 90% business in this well, music business. Well, that's not appropriation, okay. that is piracy and robbery. <laughs> okay. All right, but Sonia, back to the point that you made earlier, you had mentioned something about the business of music. And I'm going to encourage everyone who is listening to visit the World Intellectual Property Organization website. So that double IPO. And on the website, David Stops, who loves Jamaican music and really is a friend of Jamaica and Jamaican music. He wrote a book for the double IPO and it's called How to Make a Living from Music, right? Um, it's an interesting, it's a booklet and it's easy reading and it's a step-by-step -step guide. I'd encourage everybody in the industry and Fantastic, fantastic resource. And I might I add here that the University of the West Indies, the Institute of Caribbean Studies, where I teach, we have a program in entertainment and cultural enterprise management. These are the kinds of things that are being taught in that program. I encourage everybody, educate yourselves by whatever means necessary. But Copeland? Sonia, in the yes? one program, Sonia, before I go to Copeland, please, in that program, please Emo. educate these managers, right? to try not to live vicariously through the artists. Some of them want to be on stage and because they don't make it, they go into management and some other fields surrounding the music. Some of those people make the worst managers. I, you need people whose ego is into the business part of music and not trying to live through the artists. Please. Good, 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 good. Good comment there, um, Ibo. Copeland. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, I listen to everyone, you know, and it's still going back to education and teaching because it don't make sense that we have artists and managers, right? And they are more like damagers, you know? I will give you a, a, a simple thing. I used to go down to the Biscayne track in Florida. And every time I go there, I hear them playing music, music and I never hear reggae yet. And I go into the office and say, you guys don't play reggae? So we don't have any. So can you bring some? I said, yes. I carry 10 CDs go down there. And you know what the man do? When I see the man hand, look at it, hand me back. Look at it, hand me back. Only one CD he kept. I said, why give me back these things? No publishers, no credit, something named adoption, and um, nothing. And he said, we pay a fee 
to ASCAP every year, you know, before, before playing music here. So why they don't put the credits on? I had to call one of the, pro, the producer, which was a very top producer who didn't even understand anything about what I was talking about. And I educated him and said, listen, artists are losing revenues because you don't know, you know, and I told him exactly what to do. So we still have to come back to education because people don't educate the youths them and the managers them i know when you keep seminars them don't come you know i always wonder why them don't come unless them see a jay-z going be there with a special guest you have to go import chairs for fine for good people but when it's something to educate them about the business that they are in they don't really show up so we have to put a little more emphasis on educating you know, our people you know, and the players and people involved. So we can have, we can just transcend. And it's my book that I have coming out now, you know, reggae, my life is. It's like saying my life is reggae. It's not just a book about me, you know. It's lots of education is inside there that people can learn from. I, I, I have in there some of the mistakes that a lot of artists has made over the years that I witnessed and was around and see. So people can avoid those and then learn the, the right way how you go about you know, doing a tour, doing a contract, obligated to, 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 to your obligations to go do PR work. I remember when Sean Paul just burst, I used to book him up almost every weekend. We're going, boss, if I go Boston, we're going to do, we're going to do a, PA, a PA. One tune, in fact, fly all the way to Boston to go do one tune for a radio station, free. How many artists are going to do that? In ways of can't get the money, he can't bother with it. So we have to educate them to you know, the value of what they have, because I don't think them realize the value of what they have, you know, and they keep looking that, you know, there will be another tomorrow and there will be another tomorrow and the next June will come. So once we put some emphasis on that, and I'm willing to give my service to educate and teach, I wish every month I could go for you, listen to this, that, Dr. Stanley Naya, every month I'd like come up there for him to do a, a one hour presentation. If I can go all the way to Melbourne, Australia, and do it in the AWME seminar, we must stand it in my country. You know, come have it back up. Listen, Copeland, sorted. Sorted. We're going to we're going to call on you and you're going to be so tired. No, but let me I... just emphasize. <laughs> let me just emphasize that you're hearing from distinguished experienced panelists here. Please find them on all of the platforms, the social media platforms, Copeland Forbes, Lily Claire Bellamy, Ibo Cooper, for myself, Sonia Stanley, on um, Twitter at Culture Doctor on Instagram. Follow Jeria on Instagram and Twitter. There are so many ways in which you can learn, even from the very things that we're sharing on a daily basis on these social media platforms. Now, when you think about appro appropriation, though, I know we are looking at the ways in which there are big stars out there who are producing dancehall and producing reggae, but we are not earning. The Justin Bieber's the Rihanna's, you know, these are questions that are raised in some of my classes that I teach at the university. What are we going to do? In, in fact, it's about education. How do we educate those persons who do not understand that in some cases, the royalties are being paid to the right people? There are cases that are brought to court, flower gone. And, and, I, and I want to call on Lily Claire to to give us some information here. Okay, thanks, Sonia. Um, that was the other thing on my list to speak about. A lot of people argue that intellectual property has no use and no validity. And I always say to them, it's just like your house. You put a fence around, you have your front door and you close it. You have a dog in the yard, you put all of these measures in place to protect what you have. In the event that someone tries to break in, if you're a licensed firearm holder, you go for your gun or you go for your cutlass and you pick up the phone and you call the police. If you feel your work is infringed, you need to take the steps to protect your work. You, it, it makes no sense to just sit and to complain. You need to take it to the next level. And here I must commend Jamaica, because we have a dedicated unit in the Jamaica Constabulary Force that focuses exclusively on intellectual property. So there's a, we have that. We 
training has been provided for our judiciary in the area of intellectual property laws and their enforcement. So you mentioned this Florigan. He's not the only one who has been successful. You perhaps don't hear about the other instances because in a number of cases, there are settlements. So the lawful author of the work will benefit. What we have to understand though, is if you have an infringement, you have a duty to bring an action. It makes no sense to just sit down. I remember one person I know who had an intellectual property right and it was infringed by a large corporation. And she was forever complaining that she had protected her IP and it was infringed. And I kept saying to her, and what did you do? Did you go the next step? Because you have to be willing to take the next step. He took the next step and the attorneys at law that represented him were serious. They didn't ask for 1 million. They asked for multi, um, I mean, their settlement was in millions of dollars. Why? Because they recognized that if you look, if you look at the age of the artist who used the work without permission, when she became an older artist and she was performing in Las Vegas, she'd still be earning from that work. So it's not, and this is, comes back again to the whole business aspect of it. It's not what the value is today. It is what the value will also be in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years. So what you have to do is if there is an infringement of your work, which is, which is why, again, you come back to the whole thing about the evidence. And Mr. Forbes mentioned it. You need to give the proper attribution. People need to know that Sonia Stanley Naya wrote the song. Eva Cooper sang the song. It was produced by Copeland. Forbes, Lily Claire Bellamy gave the legal advice. All of us are relevant. All the mm -hmm. people in the studio who took part in it, they're all relevant. The person who told Iba that he should wear a yellow shirt and not a blue shirt. Everybody. So all of those people form part of the chain of custody. All of those people need to benefit. So it's important to ensure that you document who did what on the work because somebody may come in with one word, okay, or one line. And if the song is a multi-million dollar selling song, that person with that one line or that one word is still going to earn from the royalties. And if the work is infringed, you need to recognize that the work has value. Do not ask for $10, ask for $10,000. You must, you, and again, this comes back to history. You must recognize your worth and your value. So when somebody infringes your work, if it had no value, they wouldn't use it. That's the first thing you need to understand. If it had no value, they wouldn't want it. So the fact that it has value and it has been infringed, make sure you get an intellectual property attorney, somebody who knows and can argue your case for you and get you what you're entitled to. You've been listening to the voice of Lily Claire Bellamy, who is the executive director of the Jamaica Intellectual Property um, um, Organization right here on Reggae Oatme University, one of Jerry's signature events that we share on the Reggae, Reggae General University platform. Um, you've also been listening to Mr. Ibu Cooper, who is a lecturer at the Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts and former member of Third World. You've been listening to Copeland Forbes, tour manager, artist manager, and our moderator, Dr. Stanley, Son Dr. Sonia Stanley Nair, who is the director of the Institute of Caribbean Studies and Reggae Studies Unit at the University of the West Indies. We are, for those in radio, it is 7.37 p.m. Thank you so much nationwide for sharing with us. And for those of you in Radio Land, thanks so much for staying with us. Um, we're streaming live as well on Regamon TV through Jaria Entertainment, both Facebook and YouTube. PBCJ, Jam Vision, JCDC, Reggaeville, Facebook and YouTube, surferreggae.com, and of course, jariaentertainment.com.
um, Sonia, I throw back to you. Thank you, Colleen. So, Lily Claire, it is very, it is very clear that reggae is not a hustle. Music is not a hustle. It's a business. It is something that requires grounding and education and standards in, in terms of moving any product forward. Now, you know, we, we talk about this music because it, it's our own music. We love it. There are lots of people here who have been vibing, just, you know, interested in hearing their, their, their work on radio. But indeed, we have to shift the culture. We have to shift the culture that says music is a hustle. How do we shift that culture? And we've spoken about education. But what are some of the ways? Some people are not going to show up in a classroom. Some people are not even going to go to a seminar. Copeland said it earlier. Are we needing to go to the studios? There are very few commercial studios that are operating today. Where do we reach people? How do we reach them? Is it Clubhouse? Are you all on Clubhouse? <laughs> well, that's, that was to us. I, I went that's... to talking, Sonia. How, how we do it at the intellectual property office, we go to the schools. Well, before COVID, but now even with COVID, we have virtual meetings with the schools because we believe it is important from your in schools to get the information. So we go to primary schools because we think it is important. And in fact, in April, when we recognize Intellectual Property Day, we, we had last year an essay competition where we had, it was from primary school to the tertiary level, where persons had an opportunity to write essays about intellectual property law. And we had children from as young as seven who submitted essays because we believe that it is important to start with the children because sometimes those who need it most don't recognize that they need it. So we figure if you bend the tree when it's young, when it's old, it will have gotten the information. So we, we, we share with everybody, but we recognize the importance of sharing, especially with children, so that we'll have a generation that's coming up that intellectual property is as common as learning to read or learning to write. We think that that is where we should put our focus because if they don't learn, then we're destined to repeat the cycle. So, Ab Absolutely, Lily Claire. And let me just add that for those who are past the generation that Lily Claire is, is referencing here in the schools, at the tertiary level, if you are in fact in the business already and wish to learn about intellectual property, there's a course intellectual property um, for the cultural and creative industries taught by Jerry as chairman right now in the Institute of Caribbean Studies. You can feel free to either audit that course, sign up as a specially admitted student, um, come in, we will try to accommodate you in terms of getting your, your, your education going. Um, LLM also, Sonia, at UA. There's the LLM in, in the Faculty of Law in exactly. um, Intellectual Property Management. Absolutely. So is, we want to be able to advertise that there isn't a shortage of programs for people to be able to engage. You may not want to go as far as doing an LLM, but there are programs sitting on a class. You know, make sure that you're educating yourself. And there's a good old Google. There are all kinds of things that you can find on the internet. I try to tell my students all the time, use these smartphones smartly. Don't allow the smartphones to be smarter than you. So let's go back to the whole question of reggae gone global. So, so reggae is, is global, but there are those of us who are not understanding that we are going global with it. And I'm speaking here about the ways in which reggae has gone global, but with it has gone some of the negative aspects of Jamaica as a, as a country, as a nation state. Let me reference two things. One is the violence in our music, the violence in our society. The second thing is, of course, some of the behaviors reported about artists on the global platform. So I'm gonna throw that out there 
for you panelists to comment on. <laughs> you know, I, I'm glad you bring that up, you know, Doc, because it has been something that has been bothering me for quite a while. Every time I take up the paper overseas or anywhere, because I stay in touch no matter where I'm at, I'm seeing one of our artists involved in something that is negative, you know, whether it's a stabbing, a shooting, um, gone to jail for whatever it is. And I keep wondering, when is it going to stop? Why, why we have our artists who are in certain position, right, are being caught up in that kind of situation? It comes right back again that um, we have more artists now than years ago. You know, everybody's an artist now. You know, once him can rhyme like a lime in time, him is an artist. You see, so we come back to 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 teaching and education. And you see, like how we have Zoom and virtual thing going now. When pandemic shows that we do have to go up a you, we go sit down in our class now. Everybody can stay at them home and learn something. We I think we should formulate um, a, a kind of program we read out once a week or once a month, you know, we get some people to, to get, do the thing virtually and we get a, a, a name act because I find also our artists them have a way, or our people them have a way of um, want to lash on to a name thing. I'm sure if you ever have a seminar up a you and you say, Jay-Z is a guest speaker, you have to go import chairs in a Jamaica because it's, so, it's our mind still. Look when Kanye West come here. That same day was a Peter so symposium, you know, and down there, pack. This is Conway, you see what I mean? And Peter's so simple as was up at UA. So you, you have to get into them head now and see how them think and so you can use that way to steer them, you know, so they can have a better understanding and learn easy because they're not going to get up front of me and go all the way for you sometimes just for learn something. So we can use the virtual thing that we have going now because it's become the norm and we have to live with this thing, this pandemic for a while, even if injection get it down little, we have to live with it. So let's utilize it. But to educate and teach. And so some of these artists can have an, a certain level of academics. In, so they understand it's not just about voice because you can't sing and that's it. You know, and I think we will make some kind of impact from that perspective, you know, because moving around them, I'm moving around so many artists. Sometimes I hear some of them doing an interview, man, I have to walk out, you know, because the interviewer don't know what to ask them and them answering some stupidness when you can educate the, the interviewer about things that he may not have known. But it's when they go to Japan, them know about light nibs, them know about Dennis Brown, them know about all that from way back. And some of our people right now don't really know anything about that. So let's see if we can find a way out to take it to them. I like how Lily come to you. They have to take it to them sometime. If you don't wait, if you wait for them to come, they're not going to come. Let's take it to them. Right, and I'm sure, you know, out of 100, we, we might get 75 that latch on to it and so. It is... One of the things I, I know we need to take to our people is also the value that must be placed in what it is we have created. You know, there are times when we have heard young people in Jamaica ascribe reggae to other countries. Mm -hmm. They don't know about the music. They don't know that Jamaica is the only country in the world to have given eight distinct genres of music. I will not stop saying it. Somebody needs to contest what I'm saying if they think that I'm wrong. And I go into schools myself, and I, every time I use the opportunity to explain the embarrassment of riches that we have given the world in terms of music. So we also... It is incumbent upon us to learn about what it is we have given the world. Ibo mentioned it earlier. We need to be moving to replace guns with musical instruments. We need to be building our music education programs and also making sure that every young person in Jamaica understands what it is that Jamaica has given the world. Ibo, I know you have a lot to say here because you serve on the Jaria <laughs> Education Committee. On the contrary, you know, I don't have a lot to say on this because I will have a very check. Is the internet still there? Yeah. Yes, internet. we're hearing you well. We're hearing you. Oh, no, yeah. You know, so when the internet goes unstable, I get a warning on the screen. That's why. Yes. Um, no, I, I, I have a rather different view. It's not a perfect world. And <laughs> this is not new. This is not new. Popular music, United States and Jamaica, Trinidad, I can name those, Brazil too, has been full of virile young 
sexual energy for decades, ever since. Violence has always been a part of it, from ever since. So, we're loading it up now. Um, uh, but it's been there. What will happen is, some of them will find their way to the churches, as you can see, and they have found Jesus and, you know, oh, I've turned my back on that life. We have seen that. Some of them will die and find their way to the graveyard, which we also will see. And their, the cream will rise to the top. So some artists will survive and be something that will be there for posterity. It's not anything we can control, honestly. Um, it's something that we can support the positive though. And I go back to the powers that be, the ones who have money to invest, because I want to warn them that what they consider negative in the industry has a lot of financial support. I don't want to say much more about that, but we know where that support is coming from, and it supports the malevolence. It picks out who to support among upcoming artists. It's not a fluke. It's not always the best talent that makes it. It's the ones who necessarily can go along with a particular lifestyle. Rather than criticize and punish, I challenge that we could also find some resources to fund those who are dealing with positiveness. Because this is on my website and I've raised funds to facilitate them. When a youth leaves an area where he can get a gun this morning and comes to Edna Manley to be a bass player, I have been begging the society to support that youth. Not support Ibo, support the fact that that youth chose of his or her own volition not to be a criminal. That is worth supporting. But the struggles that we would have at that school to get a $30,000 drum set is not the same struggle that that youth would have to get a nine which costs more than the drum set. I think I think that's a really important note on which to sort of you know concretize the argument that there is so much that we're not supporting. There is so much that we're not recognizing about the value of our music. Um, the role of education really critical, um, and of course we 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 need not mistake the fact that the business of music is ninety percent music but also 90% business in the ways that um, Ibo has said. But the 90% business is so much um, about protection, about standards. The 90% of the music is about the quality. Make sure that it is of good quality for posterity. I know that there are some comments on YouTube and I'm going to throw back to the studio to yes, sorry, um, the get those 30 comments. Seconds. 30 seconds, sorry. One has to be very careful about quality. I'm a, I'm, I'm a formerly trained musician, and I try to stay away from quality arguments because quality is subjective, and it also depends on the culture. You get me? So you have to be very careful about Oh, absolutely, but we're talking about timeless, those things that can be timeless. And yes, it is subjective, because what's timeless yesterday is not necessarily going to be timeless in another generation, but and, and appreciated True. in the same way. And, and music is that nostalgia. Um, you know, the nostalgic experience around music means that there's a difference in the appreciation across the generations. But there are still some, some things that you can is isolate about hits. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about quality. Throwing back to the studio for comments. Um, thank you, Sonia. Um, the comments on YouTube are quite interesting. They're very, very interested in music education. Um, we've been hearing that you can actually go to the University of the West Indies and do courses, whether or not you're a full-time student. If you're a practitioner in the, in the industry, you can. I think the Edna Manley College offers the same kind of um, service to public if you, if you are a musician and want further training in music, um, more practical perhaps um, at the School of Music as well. Um, the question here, Sonia, that I'd like for you to share, because perhaps you, you are actually the researcher. Someone is asking where to find books. I'm interested in, in reading more about the music and its history. What are some of the books that we, you would recommend, or where do we find books on music and on music business? 
So very important question there. You know, for quite a long time, it's the people outside of Jamaica who are writing about Jamaican music, writing about reggae, writing about dancehall. But we have changed that. And I'm proud to say that I'm a part of the movement that changed that. People like Garth White, Carolyn Cooper, um, Dennis Howard, um, Donna Hope. There are so many of us who have contributed by way of books, articles, chapters, and so on. In fact, we just published at the University Press, the Dance Hall Reader, which brings together a whole set of writings about from, you know, from the history of the music and so on. The business of music is documented in Dennis Howard's book um, on the echo chamber. And there are so many of us who are writing. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. Follow us on social media. Follow me at Sonia Stanley on Twitter, um, at Culture Doctor on Instagram. There's always something new to learn. I'm constantly sharing of my own work, those of my colleagues, those around the world who are writing and researching Jamaican music. Um, we have had a fantastic discussion. I am here as your servant, usually in matters of culture, here to um, bring us through Reggae Month in the ways that we have through this open university. I want to thank our panelists, thank our technical team, um, thank our um, very own Colleen Douglas from the, the media circles and Jaria and Edna Manley. And to say that it has been my pleasure being with you. Thank you to our listeners, our viewers on all the platforms. I throw back to the studio now. And we want to thank you, Sonia, for we knew you would do this well. Um, thank you so much for being such a wonderful moderator. Um, we've been getting a lot of responses from all across the world, and we just want to acknowledge some of the spaces. Mexico, South Africa, Ghana, um, France, Brazil, all of you have tuned in. Even with time differences, you've stayed with us. We, we really appreciate that. You've actually stayed with us all month. We have one quick announcement to share that the Jaria Honor Awards, which was slated to be shared with you on the 28th, has been postponed until further notice due to the increase in the COVID-19 pandemic here in Jamaica. We just want to keep everyone safe and we wanted not to sacrifice the quality event that we normally give to you. So we've decided to postpone for a bit as we monitor the health of everyone in this industry and everyone in Jamaica. So that's the only thing that has changed so far on the Regamon calendar. Of course, you have much more on, on Regamon TV to watch tomorrow. We start with our Global Reggae Night 1 and on Saturday, Global Reggae Night 2. Um, Coffee, Capleton, Marcia Griffith, some of the artists who I'm remembering off my head. So we invite you to tune in to to Reggae Month television and some of the spaces are CPTC, CPTC Studios. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to come to you from Studio Sonia. Somebody actually wanted to you to name the, the eight genres so um, of reggae. I can certainly do that. I'd love if you do just before we wrap. Go ahead. Yes, so the, the age of, if we're coming chronologically or even <laughs> just looking from our indigenous musics, mental, scare, rock steady, um, reggae, dub, dance hall, EDM, electronic <laughs> dance music, if dub is one of our genres, clearly the, elect, the engineering techniques that went into the creation of what is this category of music called electronic dance music is very much out of Jamaica as well. And of course, there's Inaya Bingi, which we do not acknowledge but as Rastafari music there is something indigenous to Jamaica even though there are parts of that music that have come out of spaces in Africa so those genres those eight genres we claim them thank you so much and of course and and it's not just it's not just me there are ethnomusicologists encyclopedias and so on that have this information Tonya put one more rockers <laughs> rockers now now let's be clear before we go I'm glad you mentioned rockers, Ibo, because in the UK, there are genres that we don't, we don't call them the same. Lovers rock, for example. There are genres of music that have been influenced by Jamaican music as well. So reggaeton, hip hop, bangra, makosa, Afrobeats, 
um, there are so many of them. <laughs> we could we could continue this conversation for, no. for, for the rest of the night talking about this. Yes, Ibo, and, and, Ibo, and, Ibo, and it, Ibo, it, Ibo, it is important. Ibo, Ibo. It is important, though, Ibo, that we continue the conversation, and perhaps it's our opportunity to say to everyone that the Jamaica Reggae Industry Association is not a reggae month organization. We're a music industry organization, and so we exist all year round. So there are numerous opportunity. Copeland, we can't take you because Lenny go kill me. And the no, radio I just want people. to leave uh, just a condolences to Brother Shabarangs on the passing of his mother. Give thanks. You know, on behalf of the reggae fraternity here in Jamaica. Okay. Give thanks. Thank you. Um, may her soul rest in peace um, up there in reggae heaven. Um, so thank you, Copeland. We want to say a special thank you to all our panelists. Lily Claire Bellamy from Jaipo, Copeland Forbes, tour and artist manager. Ibu Cooper from the Edna Manley College, a senior lecturer there as well as former member of the Third World, our able uh, moderator, Dr. Sonia Standinaya, director of the Institute of Caribbean Studies and Reggae Studies Unit at the University of the West Indies. We want to say thank you to the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport, the Ministry of Tourism, the Chase Fund, Sajikor, Starlight Productions, JTB, TEF, CPTC, Java, Reggaeville, Rhythm Agency, Surfer Reggae, Reggae Festival Guide, M1 Production, and SR Rehearsal Studio. It has been my pleasure anchoring this. And I should say, Nationwide Radio and your listeners, thank you so much for tuning in, for supporting Reggae Month. And we hope that we can continue this conversation, more reggae conversations as the, the, the year continues. Um, it is 7.59. It is 8 o'clock. It has been my pleasure. I am Colleen Douglas. Give thanks. Shabbat Shalom. The next Do you have the Reggae Jamaica mobile app on your phone? No? Well, you could be missing out on news, views, interviews, events, and so much more about the impact of reggae music across the globe. Information at your fingertips about Reggae Month and other exciting reggae events. That's the Reggae Jamaica mobile app, now available in the Apple or the Google Play Store. Get it now! Everybody wanna be Since 2008, we have been building Reggae Month into the biggest global celebration of Jamaica's music. As Prime Minister, but more so as a Jamaican, I am proud of our reggae music and look forward to Reggae Month each February. The negative impacts of COVID-19 have denied us the pleasure of welcoming the peoples of the world to Jamaica for Reggae Month this year. But reggae music transcends all physical barriers. I send warm greetings to everyone tuned in to Reggae Month TV and social media platforms all over the world. Reggae music is quintessentially Jamaican, representing the struggle and triumph of our people through music. Through reggae, we celebrate our heritage, tell our stories, and carve out our place in the world. For many, reggae is therapeutic, especially in challenging times like these. And this is why we stage Reggae Month, to send a message of hope from Jamaica to the world that every little thing is going to be all right. I want to congratulate the industry, led by the dynamic minister Olivia Babsy Grange and the various industry associations for ensuring that in spite of the pandemic, we are still able to stage Reggae Month. I'm pleased with the many events being staged, in particular, the Reggae Month University Series with the symposia and workshops aimed at capacity building in the industry. I'm happy to see the various films, reggae conversations, and documentaries that trace the evolution of the music and the global reggae concerts that feature our superstars and emerging talents. Today, I want to express my own personal solidarity and that of the government of Jamaica with our songwriters, musicians, producers, promoters, technicians, and all others who have served in the industry in various capacities. I know you have been hit especially hard by the pandemic. And I am conscious that many of you have not been able to work for several months because of COVID-19. That is why we have sought to give 
some assistance through the CARE program and provide special grants to entertainment, cultural, and creative practitioners. I commend those of you who have sought out new ways of distributing the music and uncovering new audiences. I also want to recognize those who have used the time to hone their skills as you prepare for the safe reopening of the sector, which we are working hard to achieve. Your role is important in this regard, to get the word out that it is important to observe the necessary protocols to keep us all safe as together we work to get the industry up and running again. Partner with us as we seek to keep our population safe from the pandemic and restore peace and unity to communities. It has been proven throughout our history that when we unite all our energies for the collective good, we are assured of success. Let us rediscover reggae's power to transform individual lives and communities for the better. Next year, we will celebrate 60 years as an independent nation. We look forward, if all being well, to welcoming you all from across the world to mark this milestone. To reggae fans across the world, especially my fellow Jamaicans in the diaspora, please continue to follow all the health protocols and stay safe. We will all get through this together. Download the Reggae Jamaica mobile app, tune in to Reggae Month TV, and enjoy lots of roots-rocking reggae music virtually. One love.